Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is going to be a joint presentation, so I'm going to do the first half and Jamie's going to do the second half. We both work for IBM in the UK, currently still in the EU. Uh, and I'll talk about a couple of the projects that I'm involved with and then uh, Jamie's going to talk about one of his. Going to say something else or no, no, is that okay for now? That's good. Okay, uh, so that's the two of us. Um, those are both our Twitter handles. Uh, mine's on the bottom of each of my slides as well. So, you've been deploying applications for years and you want to move them to the cloud. You decide that cloud native is so different, you need to kind of just throw everything out and start again. It's all too difficult. Decide cloud native is a storm in a teacup. It's all going to pass. Or do you understand how to make the best use of Java in the cloud? Hopefully, you probably think that C is the better option to avoid you having to throw everything out. So what's special about the cloud? As it says there, the cloud promises a virtual dynamic environment which maximizes use, is infinitely scalable, so it will expand to whatever you want. It's always there, minimal upfront investment. So rather than having to buy a server, you pay as you go in the cloud and let somebody else run the software for you and hope it will scale up as you need it. To. So compute on demand is what, you know, it's the ideal situation for everyone. But what this does mean is that the, co the computations you do all cost money in real time. So if you use more CPU and more RAM, it's going to cost you extra. And this means that your accountants and so on will be a bit more worried if your application is chewing up more of this than is required. Computation now equals money. Gigabytes per hour is money. An increased heap size, if you need to do that, will start costing you money again. And you have to think about these things. So a typical, ap typical application over time, server-side application, where demand will go up and down depending on when your customers are coming to your website, for example. And how does your application <laughs> respond to that? Do you buy one big server and have it running all the time, at which point you need the total capacity to be at least what you have at your peak of your application? Or if you have a static server in the cloud, you get the same issue? But then you potentially got a lot of wasted money. You're paying for something in the cloud that you're not necessarily using all the time. So the better option for any cloud-based application is to break it down into smaller compute units that you can scale up as and when demand increases and scale it down when it decreases. And if you, smaller compute units are always better. This is basically the microservices model. And Jamie's going to talk a bit about that later in the second half. So if we now look at any one of these small compute units, and we're assuming in this case that they're running Java. This is the traditional profile of a Java application starting up, and it's start up and shut down that becomes more important when we're scaling things up and down in microservices. The throughput of a Java application will always go up fairly slowly, and that's because uh, the JIT needs to warm up, so it takes a bit of time. The memory also will go up, and it will peak slightly as the JIT finishes its completion, then it will go back down to a stable state. Two problems with that are the overpeak usage at the top there. That costs more money because you're having to allocate more memory than is ideal, and it's not the memory that you will be using over time once the application uh, stabilizes. And then you've got that upfront cost as well where you're not actually getting the full benefit until you get to about here. So you're wasting time and therefore money in that section at the start. That would be the best model if we could get it up and running as soon as possible and get the memory up to the peak usage and keep it flat. Which is, you might be able to do that if your application was written in C or something, but in Java or other languages that have similar runtimes, it's a bit more difficult. So these are the, what you need in the cloud. You need sm small runtime memory footprint, footprint, small deployment sizes. You want things to be able to start, and the application to be able to start and stop quickly so that your small microservices can do that. And you ideally want them to not be doing anything when they're idle as well. Can you do this with a JVM? This was an animated slide at one point. The animation seems to disappear, so you've got all three options at once. So is cloud so different from traditional scenario that JVM is no longer relevant? Yes. Throw everything out and do it with Node.js. B, maybe you could retune, or C, maybe there's a difference in the JVM you could use. Anyone remember these? <laughs> the point about this is that this contained a small version of Java called Java ME. It's not really around anymore. 
And the requirements for Java ME on the small device is a small footprint, um, because you've got very little RAM on, on these devices. You want a fast startup, because if you've got an application, you want it to get up and running quickly. And you want the ramp up to be immediate. You don't want to slow, start slowly and then for your game to kind of speed up as it goes on. That would be very strange, which rather strangely are exactly the same as what you want for Java in the cloud. Anyone heard of Adopt Open JDK? Show of hands. That's a few. That's good. Uh, so Adopt Open JDK is a project that I work on. Uh, it's sponsored with a whole bunch of different companies as well. Uh, that's where it is. We're on GitHub. And we take open source Java code, compile it, and make binaries available, including uh, the Oracle Open JDK code uh, and code from various other providers as well. And we build it and make the binaries available. And we do lots of testing on them as well. So they're good quality. Uh, that's our website. So you just go to that. You can download your JDK. You don't have to get them from Oracle or OpenJDK. You can get them from us as well. And there are commercial support offerings for that from different companies. Uh, the one other option you have is the default here. You've got the Hotspot VM, which is the base one supplied with OpenJDK. And there's the OpenJ9 option. How many of you have heard of OpenJ9? Not many at all. OK. OpenJ9 is another open source project. Uh, it was open sourced a couple of years ago, or 18 months ago. And again, you're welcome to get involved in this community, as well as the OpenJDK community and the Adopt OpenJDK community. This is IBM's J9 virtual machine, which we open sourced. It's the one that's been used in IBM applications for years. And so it's been around for a while. It's now fully open source, and we build it at Adopt OpenJDK and ship it. We merge it with the OpenJDK code base. And we provide Docker images as well. Why would you want to use it? Have a look at this. This is the uh, Java 8. And this is a comparison of the startup times. On the right, with different applications. So we've, it's not just a single application thing that we've optimized for. Hotspot is on the right on each of these diagrams. And you can see the startup time for OpenJ9 is generally less. Uh, the 0 0.8 is the version of OpenJ9 from about a year ago. 0.12 is the current one, so we've made quite a bit of improvements even over the last year. This is actually the more interesting one, is that the memory footprint is also significantly smaller. So you can see that with OpenJ9, you, about 60, 66% is what most people see as their memory footprint improvement when just by switching the JVM. Uh, the two options that it mentions on the right are ones that will optimize the startup a little bit further. And you can see from that that optimizing that doesn't reduce the memory footprint. It still stays very, very low compared to Hotspot. And the other thing that's worth noting is that OpenJ9, the versions of that are, implement, are incremented. And they go into both Java 8 and Java 11. So you still get the benefit, the advantages when we improve OpenJ9, even for your existing applications using Java 8. So this is the chart that we were looking for. That's the ideal scenario. If we look at the, what you actually get when you start up a hotspot VM, it's something like this. That's a vaguely typical curve, I believe. Um, this ha example happens to be with OpenJDK 9, but it's similar to other ones. Now I'm going to show the next slide has got this with another three charts overlaid onto the top of it. It's the, the, the hotspot one is vaguely similar to that, but it was taken from a different test, so it's very slightly different. So the yellow curve is hotspot. The gray, almost silvery one at the top is OpenJ9, the equivalent. And you can see that it's ramping up quite a bit faster uh, and has a slightly higher throughput at the end. The other two are far more similar to the curve that we're looking for, where it starts up very, very quickly and stays at a reasonably high value. It's slightly lower than a, a normal VM where it's jitted, but it does get up and running very quickly. And in the cloud, that's what you really need. Um, the red line is where we are at the moment with the current version of OpenJ9. Again, the blue line is actually what you would have seen in this chart last year. So we've m decreased the gap by about 50% compared to what it was last year. We're still putting a lot of investment into this. And that's the one that's probably the most interesting chart. So it means you can actually get these microservices or any other application you have to start up quickly. The first time you run it with the options to enable this, it's AOT ahead of time compilation. And it stores it in a cache on the disk that was reloaded when it restarts, and the JVM restarts. So the first time you run it, it will be a bit slower because it's populating that cache. The next time you start up, these are the times that you will see. 
Some of the other things we put into OpenJ9 is we've got an uh, open SSL to accelerate some of the encryption within the JVM. And you can see you get significant improvements there. Uh, this is something that's been added fairly recently, sort of in the last two releases of uh, JDK 8 and JDK 11. And you, that's all included at the moment. Um, we, are that we may try and contribute that back into Open JDK, but we haven't uh, done that yet. We've just been concentrating on trying to get it in a form that we're happy with first. So this stuff isn't new. It's all established, so it should be production ready. Anything you get from ad open, Adopt Open JDK is considered good enough to run in production. And IBM has been using it for years um, and uh, across all these different platforms on their, own on their own software. Anything that you buy from IBM that runs on Java will include the J9 VM, which is now Open J9. So this Open J9, and the reason, ah, I didn't actually mention why that uh, Java ME thing uh, was relevant. Open J9, or J9 as it was, was initially designed to run Java ME. So it was designed with all those requirements that happen to be exactly the ones we need in the cloud. So, which is why it's got the low memory footprint and everything else. And the JV, so the JVM can scale from these small devices up to the really big ones, uh, can handle constrained environments and so on. Uh, we've also got options where it automatically detects if it's running in a Docker container and will adjust the heap size, the default heap sizes. So it's got all that as well. So again, perfect for use in the cloud. It's used by some of the biggest enterprises on, on the planet. If you ever go to an ATM, you're almost certainly running through some system at the back end, which is running Java, and it's probably the J9 VM. So this is a summary. Much, much smaller footprint. Generally a faster startup. Gets, gets up and running faster without losing any performance. We run it on lots of platforms. This one, macOS, we didn't have until a couple of months ago. It's there now, and you can download the macOS builds from Adopt Open JDK as well. So, OpenJ9. You can download it, you can use it. It used to be the case that you couldn't get it unless it was within an IBM product. Now you can just download it and use it. Try it with your own application. Let us know how it goes. Generally, you should see the same improvements that we're seeing in this slide. And we've got lots of people that have tried it, and those are some of the testaments we've seen on Twitter. So hopefully that's, uh, that's been good for you. We've got some OpenJ9 stickers and things around here as well. Uh, if anyone wants one later, or you can come and talk to me if you have any questions afterwards. Um, hopefully this has given you an appetite and you've heard about OpenJ9, you'll give it a shot and let us know how it goes. Okay, I'm happy to yeah, take over, Jamie. Yeah. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jamie Coleman, I'm a software engineer for IBM. I've been there about five years now, uh, worked on lots of different products. I've worked on Kix, which is a mainframe software which essentially uh, handles transactions. Uh, most of the banks in the world use it. I help them modernize their testing infrastructure from some very old languages like PLX and Mate to Java. And now I work in uh, Open Liberty as an advocate, so I, I also worked on their Docker team, so creating all their Docker containers, maintaining their builds, creating build pipelines, um, etc. So a little quiz, um, are we done? Is that it? Um, there's nothing else to see. Um, we still need to re-architect my application, or no, there's some new challenges with cloud native Java. So. Um, Yes, essentially so. You can have the best JVM in the world, you can have the best startup times in the world, but what you run on top of your JVM makes all the difference. So we've got application design here. We've got two different ones to look at. Monolith, so this is traditional application design. Um, all your application, all your code is contained in one application. That would essentially run on one application server. And then you've got this new architecture, microservices, which is been around probably about five, ten years now. Um, but when it comes to cloud, microservices has a lot of advantages. So breaking up your application, as said before, um, brings down costs. And we want to bring down costs in the cloud. We're being charged for every second our application is running in the cloud. So breaking apart helps do that. So this is Java EE. Uh, it's been around a while. 1998 started off just one specification. And all the way to April 2013, we had over 28 specifications. So when we're talking about microservice architecture, do we really want the whole of Java EE? Is all of these specifications useful for us? Not really. Um, we only want a very small subset of those. 
So JSON B, CDI, JAXRS. Um, so really, yeah, essentially we just want to pick and choose. Now, Open Liberty, which is a Basically, we, about a year ago, we open sourced um, WebSphere Liberty, uh, which was a lightweight application server to replace um, traditional WebSphere. Um, we open sourced it about a year and a half ago, and essentially what this allows you to do is pick and choose the dependencies you require. We want a very, very small, lightweight application server, especially when running in the clouds. We want it to start up very quickly, and we don't want it to have a massive memory footprint. So selecting the dependencies you want from um, Java E helps achieve that. And we're not the only people doing this. Formtail does this. So Formtail by Red Hat and JBoss, they also allow you to pick and choose the dependencies you want, bringing your application server size down to a minimum. So again, not all cloud native challenges can be solved by the runtime. Um, there's many other things to consider. And the problem with Java EE was it was going way, way too slow for the cloud, the world of cloud, essentially. Um, cloud's been quite popular the last few years, but Java EE had not caught up with where the cloud was. So a lot of companies came together and we thought we need to solve this problem. Um, Java EE has many, many benefits, especially for enterprise software. So we all came together to essentially create a new list of specifications called MicroProfile. So hands up in here, who's heard of MicroProfile before? Okay, that's not as many as I wanted to hear. Um, so yes, so IBM and the companies at the bottom, a few of us like Microsoft, all came together to pick and choose what we wanted from the Java EE spec and then add what was missing, essentially. So microservices, good chance you're gonna use REST APIs. So here's a little snippet of code in my microservice. So the path, so that'll be the URL path you hit. Um, what the microservice produces and what it consumes. And essentially, that's all you need to, that's got a post request there, and that's all you need, and you put your logic in the actual method. Again, on the REST client, same kind of code. The only difference here is you've got at register REST client, and that, will allow, that bit of code there will allow these two microservices to talk to one another. Uh, CDI comes into play. It allows you to manage the application of uh, the life cycle of your application. So whether it's request scope, do we want the application to just stay alive while um, requests are being made? Do we want the application to start stay alive for a long time? That's things you can do with CDI, and we thought this was definitely beneficial for uh, microservice architecture. Uh, JSON B and JSON P are new ones. JSON B is my favourite. I love JSON B. Essentially, it allows you to take a Java object, you throw it into JSON B, it'll turn it into a JSON object, you then send that to a different microservice, so from A to B, and then B will take that JSON object and turn it back into a Java object. Uh, JSON P does stuff like parsing, so if you don't want to take the whole object, you can just parse certain parts of the JSON, um, which allows you to quite quickly send data between microservices. So you've got now hundreds of these microservices. You, before you had just one application running in the cloud, now you've got lots of them. Um, how do you like document? How do you like know what all these endpoints do? How do you test all these endpoints? So MicroProfile very recently has added open API support. Um, this, uh, basically if you add this feature to the Open Liberty server and all the others, it'll give you an endpoint to hit, which is, looks a bit like this, and it'll list all your different endpoints and what they do. Um, you can then test those out, and you can even edit the JSON you send and send custom JSON. Um, and this is so helpful for developers that are working on a different team. So they've now been given this microservice. They don't know what the endpoints do. They don't know what they require. So Open API helps with that, which is brilliant. Um, security. So we've got microservices, and now we've got lots of them. Now we need to worry about security. So all the companies came together and had a look at what kind of uh, implementation of security we could do. So JSON web tokens seem to be a very, very good solution to fix this. So in your code, just above your method, you can just add at roles allowed. And, and let, basically, you pass the JSON web token in the header of your request. And if it's got the right permissions and the right person is essentially trying to access that method, then it'll work. If not, it'll refuse the request. Fault tolerance is one of my favorite ones and one of the ones I use quite a lot. Um, Netflix previous, previously used to use a mechanism like this. So they would have their recommendation service at the top of Netflix. Now, what if that microservice stops working? You're just going to throw an error and all the users of Netflix won't be able to see the recommendation service. That's not quite good enough, especially in today's world. 
So what, micro, uh, what fault tolerance allows you to do is essentially you can retry trying to connect to the microservice, and if not, you can fall back to another method. So the way Netflix used to do this is if their recommendation microservice went down, they would then just show a default, like a generic um, recommendation service. So the users have no idea this service is not working. They have no idea that they're not seeing their usual shows listed there. They're just seeing a generic one. But this helps basically the program keep running and it keeps people happy using the program. So in fault tolerance, you can do stuff like max retries. So how many times you want to keep trying to call this microservice, the duration of that. Um, you can even specify the exception, so you could do all exceptions or you can specify a specific exception you want this to fail on. Um, and you, again, you have a fallback method, it's not listed there, but essentially you could say, if this fails four times, go and call this other method. So that method could do anything, it could start up another microservice or it could just send a message saying this service is currently unavailable, please try again later, rather than throwing a 404 error code or something nasty or Java exception. Uh, configuration. So. Again, we've got all these microservices, hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, they're going through different stages of a pipeline. So you've got your build, you, you're building it, you're testing it, you might have an alpha stage, and then you'll have your production. But do you really want to go into every microservice and change configuration every time? This is where configuration comes in. So essentially, you take your configuration, you externalize it outside of your microservices. So you could essentially have a configuration for the first stage of your pipeline, the testing stage of your pipeline, and production. So as your microservice application goes through these different pipelines, it will use different uh, configuration. And the good thing about microprofile configuration is you can change this while the application is running. So while the application is running, I could essentially take, make a method not work. So I wanted to do some maintenance and I want it to send a message back to another microservice. I can then go and change in the, the, configuration, the configuration file and say, um, turn off this and the application would automatically pick up that configuration. Um, and again, you can substitute anything into there like ports, um, any, any bit of information you want. So we've got all these microservices. Again, where are we now? Um, let's talk about health. Now we need to know if these microservices are live. We can't just throw requests around just hoping for the best. Microprofile health uh, does that for you. It will tell you if the microservice is down. Um, if it is down, then you can go call another method or basically just do something else that doesn't throw an error to the user. Uh, metrics is quite a good one. Um, metrics gives you loads of information out of each microservice. So uh, it'll give you JVM information. Um, and of course, you can put your own custom metrics in. So essentially, I can say, oh, I've got, I'm a barista. I've got a coffee shop. I want to know how many times orders were requested. So you can put information in there like that, which helps you um, essentially kind of figure out what the hell's going on in your microservice application. Um, open tracing is a very good one. Um, essentially, every REST request that goes through your microservices will be traced with open tracing. So you've got all of this trace for everything that goes on. Every time that REST that URL is hit, every time that endpoint's hit, every time that endpoint's hit, it's all traced. You can turn that off. By default, it is always on, but you can turn it off for certain um, uh, URLs and endpoints. Um, but you can also add your own tracing if you want. So Eclipse Microprofile, these are the main vendors here, um, IBM, Microsoft, etc. cetera. Um, and these are the main points that I want you to all take away from if you get a chance to use Microprofile is open specifications, it's all open source. Um, you can contribute to it, uh, put your own ideas in. All these companies collaborate together just so we, we got something that the whole industry can use rather than just a subset. Um, wide vendor support, you're not locked into any vendors. This is one of the problems I have with Spring, is you are locked into Spring. And if they decide to change direction or do something you don't want to do, tough, you've got to go with it. Whereas when it's, uh, you've got all this wide vendor support and it's, open spe it's all open, you can have a say in what goes on. And you're not locked into high price fees because you've got all these companies competing against each other for your business, essentially. And that's one of my main pain points of Spring, essentially. Um, and again, what all the stuff we went through, you've got REST services, um, open a API support, security, fault tolerance, et cetera. So a little quiz here. Um, you're deploying microservices that depend on other teams, and you've noticed some errors, which is causing your microservice to fail. So what do you do? Do you blame the other team every time the service fails? You tell them they need to sort their act out, essentially, and you go shout at them. Uh, you hold firm, you just sit there and think, oh, they'll fix it eventually, just sit back, everything will be fine. 
or do you take responsibility for coping with these problems and so essentially you don't have to rely on other teams? So hands up for A. No, nope. hands up for B. Hands up for C. Okay, personally I would go for A and C. I would go and shout at the other team and tell them they need to sort their act out, and, but I would also code into my microservice um, basically the ability to cope with these problems. So being ready for cloud native Java. Open standards, it's all in the Eclipse Foundation. Um, we've got a JVM optimized for the cloud now, so it'll bring up your stuff brilliantly quickly, um, saving you money hopefully. And uh, we've got an application framework designed for the cloud. So final quiz, your boss asks you to recommend an open technology stack for developing and deploying cloud native microservice applications. Now, whoever gets this right gets a free t-shirt <laughs> and some stickers. So do you recommend Eclipse OpenJ9 to optimize your uh, runtime characteristics and bring down your cost for the cloud? Do you recommend Eclipse Micro Profile to add resilience, monitorability uh, uh, in a vendor neutral way? Or do you recommend the right sizable runtime uh, e.g. Open Liberty to optimize your deployments for the cloud, or all of the above. So hands up for A, hands up for B, hands up for C, and hands up for D. Awesome, you all get a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm not going to start throwing them out because there's too many to throw away. So just calculating and you're all ready for cloud native Java. Thanks for our talk and if you can give us any feedback that would be brilliant.